to me, can't you see? I'm living life in harmony. Got the sun shining down on me. Alrighty, everyone. Welcome. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. And thank you for joining us on our third day of Ramadan 360 with Al Maghrib Institute. I start to lose count very early on, so please feel free to remind me or let me know in the chat. I always lose count of the days and the years as well. Alhamdulillah. It's great to see, mashallah, many familiar names. Now we're getting familiar with you guys, mashallah, the new folks who've been coming in for this year. Um, and inshallah, Ashley faces soon as well. Let me turn on the video capability so you guys can join us here on screen. Um, Jazakum Allah khair, brother Bilal, we've missed you. I don't know if I haven't seen you in the beginning of the sessions. Shukri from New Jersey, or sorry, New York. Hadra from Toronto, Shafa from Michigan, Carrie Johnson, nice to see you. Third day, mashallah, in a row, Carrie, Rafia, um, Hassan Rajab from the Maldives, mashallah, everyone's favorite vacation destination. Aisha, or Aiza, sorry, mashallah, welcome, welcome, welcome to all of you who are joining us on screen and who are coming here in the chat. I saw a lot of folks saying their salams um, and, you know, chiming in here where they're coming in from Philippines in the house. You know, I love how people were waking up. Some people are having sahur and saying, oh, I got to run. I got to pray fajr. I got to start work. I got to do these things. Some people, of course, in the UK, I know it's your tarawih time. And then some of us are still in the middle of our fast. That's the beauty of this kind of international ummah. And to be able to see that kind of in real time and to connect, it makes it so much more real, alhamdulillah, through this community. So jazakallah for being part of it. Of course, if you're watching us on YouTube, please make sure that you do, uh, especially throughout the month, it gets kind of hectic and and it, it gets even more beautiful the way that we get a chance to connect with each other. So do join us through Ramadan360.org. You can register for free. You get access to your student portal uh, and you can be part of this lovely uh, tribe here in the chat. Alhamdulillah. Yes, truly worldwide. Alhamdulillah. Great to see you uh, all who are saying your slams. Ghana in the house. Mashallah. I saw Congo yesterday. We had Nigeria. Let's get everyone on. And of course, thank you to those who have been joining us early and making sure that you're settled and uh, good to go in the sessions. I know a couple hundred of you here on Zoom. Um, just a reminder, once again, we do tend to hit the capacity these days. So uh, once we hit the thousand mark, then um, we will, if you do exit the room, you may not be able to get back into it until maybe the end of the session. Um, so just keep an eye out for that. If you're coming in on YouTube again, and you want to be part of the Zoom community, make sure you do it sooner rather than later so that you don't miss out on anything uh, fun, inshallah, here on Zoom. Um, with that said, now I think some of you are, are kind of, I think you could probably recite some of these reminders or announcements that I say in the beginning just to get everybody, uh, you know, up to speed. Um, I know some, some people are still kind of coming in and new to the session. Mashallah, so many of you are still registering. Please feel free to share the link for Ramadan 360 to your friends and family so they can be part of this community as well. Uh, but if you're new to the experience, yes, this is a 30 day daily live experience. 5 p.m. EST is when we go live each day. Uh, it runs for about an hour, 15, hour and a half-ish, depends. Unless sometimes we're blessed with a little bit of extra time with our speakers. The first half of the experience is a Ramadan 360 lecture or reminder with one of our Amagrib instructors. And the second half is with Another is a Maghrib instructor, Ustada Taimiya Zubair, uh, who is doing a daily Tadabur session with us. And that's where you guys get to kind of stretch your Tadabur muscles and reflect on some of the lessons and some of the themes that we cover every single day. Alhamdulillah. Uh, we're going to have the same, inshallah, at the end of this session. So make sure that while you're while you're going through the first half with Sheikh Naveed Aziz, that you're taking note, that you're thinking of any gems, anything to know, anything that really makes, made you reflect uh, and making note of that when Ustada Taimiya asks you for your reflections as well at the end. Khadija from Pennsylvania, Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah here in the chat. And YouTube, guys, we don't forget about you. I got to pull up for YouTube more often. I'll, I'll keep an eye on the YouTube chat. Sometimes the Zoom one is moving so fast, it's hard to keep up. But shout out to folks who are coming here on YouTube. Of course, um, this experience every single year is made possible by some amazing uh, organizations that we partner with in Canada, the US, and the UK. Alhamdulillah, in Canada this year, we have Islamic Relief. In the US, we have HHRD. And in the UK, we have Forgotten Women. We're very selective. We have some really awesome charity partners who are doing some of the essential work on the ground, taking care of the most vulnerable in our ummah. And I highly encourage you guys to please continue to support them in YouTube. The links are in the description, in the chat. They're shared here periodically. And whenever you're reminded, please do support. And most of them have the ability to, to have multiple different currencies. So wherever you're coming in from, you should be able to support in your local currency. Of course, this experience is made possible to you by a Maghrib Institute. This is just a taste of some of the amazing work that we're able to do throughout the year. Alhamdulillah, this is a live virtual program, which is a taste of our live virtual programming, but we alhamdulillah have uh, 
online pre-recorded professionally filmed seminars. We have a faith essentials program. We have a Quran revolution program and a blessed voyage. So much more. Alhamdulillah. We try to find ways to benefit the ummah where they are, how they can benefit the most. Alhamdulillah. And we're international in, I think, eight or nine different countries, multiple different continents through Canada, the US, the UK, Scandinavia, Australia, Singapore, Malaysia, and now, mashallah, through this uh, beautiful online community in so many more, mashallah, countries virtually as well. Alhamdulillah. Germany in the house. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa zareen. Welcome back. Bosnia, mashallah, in the house as well. Lots of love for Bosnia. Alhamdulillah. Um, with that said, um, we also have our daily giving campaign. If you want to be part of the Ajr, part of the amazing work that Amal does and make it possible for people to continue or to, 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 to grow their learning journey, especially adults, when you facilitate Dean for an adult and you, you bring them closer to, to, to authentic knowledge and you make it a part of their daily routine, you change lives, you change communities, you change the world, inshallah. So please do support consistently as you guys have been. We hit our goal yesterday, by the way, that one thing I forgot was to mention that in the chat is, is we, we, we didn't hit it by the end of the session. We were almost there, but alhamdulillah by today, we hit uh, just over 400 folks who came in to help out daily uh, for Ramadan. Every single day in Ramadan, you'll get uh, be part of the Ajr and part of the, the Baraka of this community. Alhamdulillah. Jazakumullah khair. Yes, Alhamdulillah. We're super excited. We're going to keep pushing. We're going to keep keep aiming higher and higher. This is just the third day. There's so much good that we can do together as a community. But I just wanted to celebrate that with you guys. And I'll share that link here in the chat as well so that you guys are able to contribute. You can do as little as $2, $5, whatever is possible in your own currencies per day, inshallah. And we're so excited to be able to have that that regularity in our in our um donation and our ajar alhamdulillah every single day that said um i think we've gone through everything the main thing that i get i still get questions about yes all these sessions are recorded yes you have access to the amagar portal and on youtube some of the recordings stay up but sometimes those can be a little iffy or we have we've had issues in the past so i do highly recommend if you're registered to make sure that you do check out the re recordings in the portal they're available every single day um and they go up within about 24 hours of course, today we're joined by one of my favorite, one of the OG Amagrib instructors, Sheikh Naved Aziz. And this topic was so perfect. I feel like I don't know who assigns these topics to who, but mashallah, when I think of Sheikh Naved, I think of humility. I think of that. That's the so humility and the seerah. The seerah of the Prophet is one of his specialties. Whenever he, he speaks on the seerah, you've got tears flowing in the entire room. He's taught over 40 classes with us at Al-Maghrib on site, mashallah, and he's done so much more content with us, bonus stuff online on Faith Essentials. He's a veteran of the Ramadan 360, the Hijjah 360, and a lot of our online programming. So if you've been an Al-Maghrib fan, you're not new to him, but it's still an honor. And I hope that those who are, are new, you guys benefit immensely from this session, inshallah. So uh, <clears throat> join me in welcoming Sheikh Naveed Aziz. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Sheikh Naveed. How are you doing today? Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Hafsa, what's happening? Long time. Literally, it's I think it's last Ramadan. Or yeah, at least probably, or yeah. probably the Hijjah 360 or last Ramadan. It has yeah. been a long time. Alhamdulillah. How are you, Sheikh? I love the, the Medina background as always. Alhamdulillah. Of course, if you can't be there physically, you might as well be there on Zoom, right? <laughs> Absolutely. I see. I feel like your heart is always in Medina. Mashallah, Sheikh. Always, always. What's new with you, Sheikh? It's been way too, way too long. What's, what's yeah, I mean, on? long overdue for a, a catch up, but um, not too much. Alhamdulillah. You know, trying to make the most of this Ramadan um, you know you never know subhanAllah I, one of the things I re I've been reflecting on is the people of Gaza and Palestine they were looking forward to this Ramadan mm -hmm. and those that have passed away may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon them mm -hmm. forgive them and accept them as shuhada I mean you know they're wishing that they could come back and spend another Ramadan right mm -hmm. and then those that are alive you know we're hearing these horror stories of you know them asking scholars are our, our fast valid because we have no food to eat or, or drink subhanallah yeah. so that's i think been at the forefront of our mind subhanallah like how do you make the most of this month recognizing that we live such privileged lives compared to everything that's going on right so yeah, I think that's the the big thing that's on on everyone's minds these days. Subhanallah. Jazakumullah khair. Sheikh, it's an important reminder. We're 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 all trying to, to to push ahead and try to still put like enjoy the benefit and the barakah of the month and do what we can. But it's we can't take anything for granted. I don't think people in Gaza knew last Ramadan this is the situation that they would be here. Subhanallah. Sahih. Subhanallah. May Allah make it easy. Um, I'll for pass it off to you, inshallah. But... <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. It's it's a tough place to start but it's important it's important for us to to to, to be reminded consistently as, as part of this yeah. and that's part of the reason why we're here as a community the entire world is is grieving and is is making the eye and, and doing what we can so just like for that reminder let's jump in into your session bismillah thank you so much 
Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyyana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma la ilma lana illa ma'allamtana, fa'allamna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'na bi ma'allamtana wa zidna ilma ya kareem. My dear brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, thanking him, seeking his aid and assistance, and seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for our sins, and seeking refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from any evil that we may have and any shortcomings uh, that we may have. We begin by asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us beneficial knowledge and to make the knowledge that we have a proof for us and not a proof against us and to increase us in all knowledge that will bring us closer to him and closer to Jannah. Allahumma ameen. <clears throat> I know I started off on a, on a very heavy note and I apologize for that. <laughs> but, you know, it's... Uh, you got to say what's honestly on, on the hearts and minds these days. You know, the topic of humility is a, is a very, very important topic. And I'll, I'll start off with the reverse. The Prophet wasallam he tells us that no one with an atom's weight of pride will enter into Jannah. Right? Meaning that if you have just an atom's weight of pride and arrogance in your heart, even with all of the iman in the world, you will not be entered into Jannah. Like that is the danger of kibr. That is the danger of, of, of arrogance and pride. And the exact opposite of pride and arrogance is humility. So I think as a starting point, it's very important to understand why we're studying this subject is because the end goal is to get into Jannah and to be protected from the hellfire. And we have very clear narrations that talk about that. Now, when we talk about humility, particularly in the Arabic language, we're going to be looking at three terms. Two of them are related in our relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of them is with our relationship with one another. So in our limited time together, I want to try to explore these three terms to the best of our ability. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us tawfiq. So the first of them is dhul. And I'll, I'll give you some context as to why we're beginning with this. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah in Madarij al-Salikin, when he talks about what does it truly mean to worship Allah? And he brings together three emotions that need to be present in worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Love needs to be present. And he, this is mahabba. And then al-khudu' wa dhul. And khudu' and dhul is what we will be focusing on, inshallah, our discussion today with regards to our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So with regards to a dhul, this is to come broken in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is to come in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having no ego whatsoever. Ever. Now, why is that so important in our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And particularly when we think about worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why does this emotion need to be present? If you understand who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, and I hope you have all benefited from the work uh, that Sheikh Amar Shukri has done on the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is perfect in every sense of the word. We understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is strong. We understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is generous. We understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is self-sufficient. Now, when you understand all of this about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what this should do is help us understand ourselves as well. That while Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is self-sufficient, we are dependent upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. While Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is strong, we are weak. While Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is generous, we have nothing except for that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us. So if you were to take Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of the equation of our lives, we are non-existence, right? Our presence is as good as our absence at that point. And this is what dhul actually means, to recognize that you are broken in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that fixes you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that makes you whole and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that makes you complete. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves when the slave of Allah is in those difficult situations and he raises their hands. Because these are moments of desperation that force the slave to be sincere. There can be no showing off at that time. There can be no mixed intentions at that time. There can be no directing your worship to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that time. Because you're in such a difficult situation, the heart recognizes that it can only turn to Allah at this point. It can only turn to its creator and sustainer. So when it comes to our relationship in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are 
to have this dhul, to have this concept of being broken in front of him. And had it been in front of anyone other than Allah, this would be a negative attribute. In front of the creation, we're not meant to have dhul. We're not meant to have this level of humility where we feel debased. But in front of Allah, it's a praiseworthy characteristic. It is a praiseworthy trait that, oh Allah, without you, I am nothing. Oh Allah, without you, I would not exist. So understand the difference that something in front of Allah can be considered praiseworthy. But when it comes to other human beings, then it is something that is criticized. It is something that is criticized. And this dhul, this brokenness is from those things. Then we have al-khudu' which is to basically be humble in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this is more of a knowledge-based humility in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So when you look at the story of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creating Adam, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling the angels, you know, teach Adam the names of all those things, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala questions them about Adam, what do the angels say? They say, we have no knowledge except for that which you have given us, except for that which you have given us. So this humility of knowing that without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we would be ignorant. Without guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we would be misguided. And we would not have any guidance whatsoever. So this combination of being spiritually and physically broken in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, while having intellectual humility and knowledge-based humility, these are characteristics that we need in our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'm not going to focus too much on that. But what I will say is look out for my classes on Madaraj al Salikin, And inshallah, we'll discuss that more over there in detail. ta'ala. Now let's focus on the crux of our conversation, which is humility with one another. Humility with one another. And I want to share this wonderful story. It's wonderful because I appreciate how gangster, you know, Al-Hasan al-Basri rahimahullah ta'ala was. Um, that one day he saw a man walking on the street, very arrogant, like chest up, head up, looking above everyone. And he's walking down the street <laughs> like this. And Al-Hasan al-Basri, he stops him on the side of the road and he says, hey, what are you doing? And the man responds, do I know you? And Al-Hasan al-Basri responds by saying, yes. He says, at the beginning of your life, you were a clot. At the end of your life, you will be a rotting corpse. And in between, you're carrying excrement inside of you. And he walked away. And subhanAllah, if you look at this story, like this is a, a very valuable lesson in the way that we perceive ourselves as human beings. right? If you perceive yourself that at the beginning of your life, you are nothing. You are just a clot. <clears throat> at the end of your life, you're going to be a rotten corpse. And then in between, whatever you know, greatness you think you have, at the end of the day, you still have human bodily functions that you have to fulfill. And no one escapes those. And if you understand that, then how can you be arrogant? How can you be proud? And I'll share you know, the exact opposite of this with you that people that think they're, that they're arrogant, I want to share a story of, of humility with you as well. You know, I remember a couple of years back, uh, we were at Hajj, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring us back this year. Allahumma ameen. We were at Hajj, and we got off at, uh, we were on the bus, we got off at a gas station uh, just to, to freshen up, buy some snacks, and to continue our journey. And as we got down, um, there was a long queue for the women's lineup. And a uh, sister gets into the queue for the to use the bathroom. And, you know, she goes into the toilet for no joke, maybe like a few seconds. And she comes out and she's crying. And I don't mean like there's tears in her eyes. I mean, she's straight out bawling her eyes out. And one of the logistics uh, leaders in our groups you know, his name is Arafa, believe it or not. His actual name is Arafa. <laughs> he goes up to the sister and he says, Ukhti, you know, what's wrong? Why are you crying? Is everything okay? Like she's crying that you would think that subhanAllah, something catastrophic has happened. And then she ends up telling him, you know, I desperately need to use the bathroom, but the bathroom is in a catastrophic state. And unless you've been to like Hajj, and you like tries to you try to use the toilets at Muzdalifa, even though we weren't in Muzdalifa at this time, you you're not gonna understand like how bad this was. Like 
the, the toilets are just in a in a deplorable, deplorable state. And she's like, I really need to use the bathroom, but I can't. It's it's filthy and disgusting inside. Now I want you to think, what are our options as human beings at that time? What are our options as human beings at that time? You could say, you know what, may Allah make things easy for you. You know, why don't you go somewhere in the middle of the desert? No one can see you and you can go over there. Or you can say, you know what? Why don't you just hold it in till we get to Makkah or Medina? I don't remember which direction we were going in at that time. Or you could do like something like beyond imagination that you would think, subhanAllah, you know, where does a, a person like this actually come from? Arafah himself, he went and he told, you know, all the sisters, please move away. I'm going to go inside and clean the toilet. And he went inside and with his own you know, hands, he got some towels or whatever he had access to. And he went and he cleaned the toilet to the best of his ability so that the sister could use the toilet. And subhanAllah, the sister, she, you know, she, has, she comes out and she's crying again and she has tears in her eyes. <laughs> but this time is the exact opposite. Like she's so overjoyed. She's so like grateful and thankful and making these, you know, innumerable du'as for him. And I was like, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. It reminded me of that famous hadith where the woman that had lost her child and then she finds her child and she's crying before and after. You know, it's a very similar story over here. But again, you know, this act of cleaning a toilet that you are not responsible for making dirty. I mean, even cleaning a toilet, you yourself have made dirty requires a level of humility, subhanAllah. But cleaning a toilet that you did yourself did not make dirty requires an extra level of, of, of humility, Right. And this is the story I, I, I like to share. And this is going to eventually become one of the lessons towards the end of the lecture. How do we instill humility in our hearts? By doing those actions that take away our ego. By doing those actions that take away our ego. So I wanted to share both you know, sides of the story with you um, as we discuss this. So as we talk about you know, signs of humility, what exactly are we looking for? The first sign of humility is to not have the desire of being in the limelight or being, you know, the center of attention. The Prophet Sallallahu did not act like that, nor did he dress like that, nor did he speak like that. Oftentimes when uh, dignitaries from other lands used to come and visit, they would not be able to recognize who the Prophet Sallallahu was because of how simply the Prophet Sallallahu dressed how similar he spoke and ate like his companions, that there wasn't a way to physically discern who the Prophet Wasallam was. So the first sign of humility is that you don't want to be the center of attention. And this is why when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes Ibad al-Rahman at the end of Surah Al-Furqan, in fact, in one of the very first descriptions, what does he say? He says, وَعِبَادُ الرَّحْمَانِ الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْعَرْضِ هَوْنَا that these select slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the select slaves of Ar-Rahman, they are the ones that walk upon the earth with humility. That walk upon the earth with humility. And so many lessons and signs just in the beginning of this ayah that the Ibad Ar-Rahman, they're not people that are reclusive to themselves, but rather they are ones that go out and about. And the indication is that they are walking on the earth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they are accessible. And when they do walk, they walk with humility and not with arrogance and pride. And people want to be around them and people aren't, you know, re repelled by their presence. Just from this one simple ayah, you could draw all of that. So the first sign of humility is not wanting to be the center of attention and not doing those things that would bring attention to yourself. The second sign of humility is that we feel uncomfortable when people praise us. We feel uncomfortable when people praise us. And subhanAllah, in Al-Adab Al-Mufrad, one of the uh, texts written by Imam Al-Bukhari, I know we're familiar with Sahih Al-Bukhari by Imam Al-Bukhari, but he has a, a secondary text known as Al-Adab Al-Mufrad that focuses on etiquettes and adab. And in this, there's a chapter that says, ماذا يقول الرجل إذا زكية? That what does an individual say? When they are praised. What does an individual say when they are praised? And this is often attrib attributed to be 
the dua of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. But when Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah quotes it, he says, one of the companions. He just leaves it vague and does not uh, be specific about it. That they say that when the, the, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa taught us to say that when we are praised, is to say, Allahumma la tu'akhidhni bima yaqulun wa ja'alni khayran mimma yadhunnun wa khfirli lima la ya'lamun. That, O oh Allah, do not hold me accountable for what they say about me and make me better than they think of me and forgive me for that which they do not know about me. So here is a, is a wonderful lesson that when we are praised, we turn that praise to be a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is a favor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? This has nothing to do with you and has everything to do with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thus, when an individual is praised, they shouldn't allow that praise to reach their heart, but rather as soon as they hear it, they turn it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then they make this dua, that, Oh Allah, do not hold me accountable for that which they say about me. Meaning that I am not seeking this praise from them. They said it out of their own accord, and that was beyond my control. If it was within my control, I would have stopped them from praising me. In fact, in Al-Adab Al-Mufrad, Imam Al-Bukhari actually states that if someone praises you, throw sand in their face. Throw sand in their face. So not, that's not something that I would say you actually do. But the, 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 the point is, you shouldn't want people to praise you. If they do praise you, channel that praise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لَا تُؤَخِذْنِي بِمَا يَقُولُونَ وَجَعَلْنِي خَيْرًا مِمَّا يَظُنُّونَ And make me better than that which they think of me. And make me better than that which they think of me. And this is, subhanAllah, beautiful dua to, to make that these individuals, they think good of you. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make you better than that. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make you better than that. And this is something that we strive for where our private lives are better than our public lives, right? In public, you're praying in the masjid, you're giving sadaqah, you're reciting Quran, you're going for hajj and umrah, all of these deeds that are done publicly. But what are we doing privately, right? A sign of humility is that your private life is equal to or better than your public life. And you want to strive to get to that. You want to strive to get to that. And this is why you make this dua that, Oh Allah, make me better than they think of me and make me better than they think of me. And forgive me for that which they don't know about me. Because at the end of the day, we're all sins. Uh, we're all sinners. And we all have mistakes and we all have shortcomings. And as a part of our adab, as a part of our akhlaq, we don't expose our sins. We don't allow our sins to be exposed. We are meant to be people of dignity. We're meant to be people of dignity. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us for our sins, that which people do not know about, for that which people do not know about. Now, I want to get back to the second point in the dua, which was, make me better than they think of me. The great imams of the past, they used to say that if people think good of you, know that it has nothing to do with you and everything to do with the faults that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has concealed of you. And has everything to do with the faults that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has concealed of you. So people's impressions of you is not about you being great, but it's about Allah's immaculate ability to hide and conceal our faults from the people. With regards to the third point in the dua that, you know, forgive me for that which they don't know about me, i.e. the sins and mistakes that I have. The scholars of the past used to say that how amazing it is that our sins do not have an odor. For if they did, no one would want to be in our company. For if they did, no one would want to be in our company. So this is a second sign of humility that when you are praised, you feel uncomfortable and you channel it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third sign of humility is to recognize that our that we are all filled with mistakes and sins. Right? We're all filled with mistakes and sins. Abdullah ibn Mubarak, rahimahullah, he used to say, when you enter into a room, consider yourself to be the most sinful of people, of those present. Consider yourself to be the most sinful of people that are present. Now, why would you think like that? You would think like that to eliminate and uh, eradicate any arrogance and pride that you may have. 
right? It's a, a very common thing to look down upon people. We may think, subhanAllah, I dress better, I have better clothes, you know, I have a better perfume or a fragrance, I have a better education, I have more money, I have a bigger house, I have a faster car. I have all of these things, subhanAllah. So shaitan will use that knowledge that you have to make you look down upon people and to feel better than people. How do you snap yourself back to reality? By reminding yourself that you are the most sinful person in this room right now. And you have no error, no right to be arrogant and no right to be proud. You have no right to be arrogant and no right to be proud. So these are simple signs of humility that we should be striving for. ta'ala. A fourth sign, and this is the last sign that we'll focus on, inshallah, is having the power and courage to say, I don't know. Having the power and courage to say, I don't know. So particularly when we come to religious gatherings, if a teacher asks a question and wants you to participate, by all means, raise your hands and participate. In fact, it's one of the worst things that you can do for your relationship with your teacher that they ask you to participate and you don't participate. You just sit there silently, you know, staring into the sky. But outside of that sitting, outside of that setting where your teacher is asking you to participate, if you're in the gathering and someone is sharing uh, a question, even if you feel you know the answer, unless you are 100% certain and are in a position of a teacher and an authority, don't volunteer yourself. Don't volunteer yourself. In fact, we see the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum when they used to be in gatherings and someone would ask a question, they would refer the question to the next companion till you would go around full circle and no one has answered the question. No one has answered the question. So this shows the humility that the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum had. So when it comes to you know, being in a position of answering questions, refer it to someone else. Pass it on to someone else. Fight that desire to show off that I know the answer. Fight the desire to show off that I know the answer. And in fact, you see this in other interactions of the companions radiallahu ta'ala anhum as well. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa asked, uh, that there is a tree that is like the believer. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhum, he knew the answer to this, but he didn't say it. He didn't say it out of humility and out of shyness in front of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So also having humility when it comes to the knowledge that we have, that we don't put ourselves at the forefront, that we don't put ourselves at the forefront. Now, I'll, I'll give that this short disclaimer here. Unless you're like the imam of the masjid or the sheikh of the community, if someone comes and asks you a question, if you don't know the answer, tell them that you will find out and get the answer for them. But if you don't, if you do know the answer and this person needs your help, you can't, you know, be humble at that time and have humility at that time and say, I don't know, please go to someone else. Helping them in their time of need is more beneficial than to uh, feign humility at that time, than to feign humility at that time. So now, those are four signs of humility that we want to strive for. And to get closer to my conclusion, how do we actually go about attaining humility? How do we actually go about attaining humility? The first of them is studying the dangers of arrogance. Is studying the dangers of arrogance. And when we talk about the dangers of arrogance, I mean this from two fronts. Number one, from textual perspectives. And then number two, from interactions with people, from interactions with people. What are interactions like with people that are arrogant? They completely rub you the wrong way. You don't want to be in their company. You probably you know, want to make dua against them at some point to may Allah you know, humble them or whatever it may be. And that has to be a lesson for us that if that is how we feel around arrogant people, then we want to make sure that we're not like those people. And then from a textual perspective, you know, subhanAllah, just a couple of nights ago, as we began reading Surah Al-Baqarah, what was the demise of Iblis? Aba wa wa kana min al -kafirin. That he refused, he was arrogant and proud, and thus he became from the disbelievers. And thus he became from the disbelievers, right? So his crime was pride. So this sin of pride is so detrimental, so harmful, 
that you could take someone that was in the company of angels and, you know, destined to be in paradise to a certain degree. And I use that term loosely as a, as a saying, not as a, as a factual statement. And thus humiliated and disgraced because of their arrogance and pride. We find the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that talk about individuals within Adam's weight of arrogance and pride will not be entered into paradise. That means where are they going to end up? In the hellfire. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that. Related to this, we get to point number two. Study the virtues of humility. Study the virtues of humility from a practical standpoint and a textual standpoint. Everyone loves the humble person. Everyone loves the person with humility. Try to be like that. From a textual standpoint, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he tells us, مَن طَوَادَ عَلِ اللَّهِ That whoever lowers themselves for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise them. And how many people do we find that the case to be, subhanAllah, that these are the humblest of people and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has raised their name and their mention amongst the believers, subhanAllah, because of the humility that they have. Number three, doing those actions that will instill humility inside of you and reminding yourself of those things. And we'll make that actually point number four. So number three, doing those actions that will instill humility inside of you. And this can be in your interactions with people. So always try to be the first person that gives salams to everyone, right? This is a sign of your humility, that you're never too good or too big to not give salams to everyone, right? Try to be the first person that gives salams to uh, people. Depending on your relationship with people, go out of your way to help them. So with our teachers, subhanAllah, we would strive our utmost best that outside of the masjid, go and grab their shoes and to put it in front of them out of respect for our teachers and for your parents as well. Do the exact same thing. Go out of your way to go and grab their shoes and put it in front of them. You may think, subhanAllah, in our culture, we don't touch shoes. And I agree with you. It's not a customary thing for us to do, but these are things that will instill humility, a good type of humility in its proper place. Number three, and this is the one I want to emphasize the most, is always be the one that apologizes. Always be the one that apologizes, right? Even though you may not have done something wrong directly, but if someone was hurt by an action that you did, even unintentionally, be the first to apologize. Be the first to apologize. It can go such a long way. And apologizing to someone will put your ego aside. Apologizing to someone will put your ego aside. Uh, aside. Number four is thinking of your own origins, thinking of your own origins. Going back to the statement of Hassan al-Basri, you were born and you were a clot, you're going to die and you're going to be a corpse and in between you're carrying excrement, right? If you understand this about yourself, you have no reason to be arrogant and to be proud. And then the last thing that I'll conclude with, because we're on 3.30 at the, at the dot or 5.30 on the dot for those of you in East Coast, is to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for humility, right? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removes arrogance and pride from our heart and replaces it with humility and replaces it with humility. So to summarize, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we want dhul and khudu being broken in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being almost debased in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but in front of no one else. And also having khudu, meaning submitting to the commands of Allah, not having any knowledge, not having any guidance without Allah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being the source of that. And then with our fellow creation, having that humility of where we feel that we are not better than them, but in fact, we are the most sinful amongst them, that we need to rectify ourselves. We do those actions that will instill humility inside of us. We contemplate our own creation and our own being. We think about where humility will end up and where arrogance will end up. And then we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from the humble and the pure hearted. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Jazakum Allah khairan for your attention. And Hafsa, I hand it over to you. Barakallahu fiki.
Jazakumallah. Sheikh Naved for that beautiful reminder and those practical listed out lessons for us to, to implement. Um, if you have some time, Sheikh, we haven't had a chance yet to do questions in the chat. So I don't know if anyone has questions on the topic of humility that Sheikh Naved just covered. Feel free to take a second to drop them into the chat um, and to, to share them. I know it takes a second to type, so please do so, inshallah. If, if there's no questions, inshallah, we'll move on to our second part of today's segment. Uh, I know there's, mashallah, a lot to cover and there's a lot to reflect on, I'm sure. Uh, with a lot of you. I see some hands up, actually. So if you're hands up and you're asking a question, please keep it concise, but you're welcome to do that as well. We'll take a couple if that's okay, Shay. Um, and I see Umber, I see first on my list. So Bismillah, I'll ask you to unmute. Please go right ahead. Assalamualaikum, Sheikh. Thank you so much for your presentation. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My pleasure. Uh, I had a question regarding the point you made about... Um, always being the one to apologize and being the first to apologize. Um, from an Islamic perspective, where do we draw the line where sometimes if you're the one apologizing and I feel like the other person isn't able to take ownership or that doesn't really help your relationship grow because then they assume that they don't do anything wrong. Do you know what I mean? Understood. Understood. So these are often signs of being in an abusive relationship. And, you know, often when we talk about abuse, we may be thinking about physical abuse um, or, you know, psychological abuse, but it can be even emotional to a certain degree. So with that being said, we want to make sure that we're not enabling people in their abuse. So I'm just talking about normative case scenarios where, you know, two friends have had a quarrel. They both said things to each other. You know, even though you may have said something that you didn't mean or there was in it was perceived in an incorrect manner, those are the situations that I'm referring to. Be the first to apologize. As the Prophet wasallam said, that the better of the two is the one that initiates the salams first. And this concept of apologizing is incorporated in initiating the salam first. So that's what I would say where it should be implemented. But with regards to enabling, we shouldn't enable people's bad behavior. And we need to take other practical steps like advising them, making dua for them, speaking to them about their behavior. And if we're not the right person, getting someone else to speak uh, to them about their behavior. And that is how we handle those situations. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Jazakallah khair. Thank you. Mayaki. Great question, Amber. We'll take one more on the mic and then we'll take one from the chat, inshallah. Kanwa, you're welcome to, to speak this minute. Go ahead. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum uh, salam wa barakatuh. I was really reflecting on the signs of humility that we have talked about and what we see in today's world, being in the corporate uh, world and climbing up the ladder and whatever we do in the real world, which is by being the center of attention, being very comfortable in taking the praise and uh, being first off to answer and coming off as a person who knows it all. So where do we draw this fine line where the deen and the dun dunya is balanced? I think that's a, a, a great question. And um, I apologize if my answer is not uh, pleasing to everyone, but I believe corporate culture is very, very toxic. And uh, it's a culture that Muslims were not created to thrive in. In fact, it's the antithesis of almost everything that Muslims believe in, right? Uh, even from an economic philosophy, corporate culture is based upon pure capitalism that as Muslims, we should not uh, embrace at all. So with that being said, if someone finds themselves within corporate culture and they don't find a way out for them, uh, selves in the sense of they can start up their own business or find you know another job or profession, then you try to make the the best of it. And what I mean by that is being the leading good example of what it means to be a good and ethical person. So let your actions speak louder than your words, right? Put in the extra effort, put in the extra time, you know, be more creative than everyone else, be more organized than everyone else, be earlier than everyone else, stay later than everyone else. But let your actions lead by an example as opposed to those things that are un-Islamic that will put you at the forefront, right? So things like you asking yourself, uh, you know, asking to, to be praised and things like that that you've mentioned. So it's not a clear-cut answer, but you try to make the best of a situation by leading by example through your actions, asking help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he protects you and guides you through this journey uh, till Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes a way out for you. Um, that would be my answer, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Jazakumullah khair, Sheikh. Very thorough answer. We'll take one from the chat, inshallah, and then we'll finish off. There's so many great questions coming in, mashallah. People really put the effort into them. Jazakumullah khair to those who've written them out. Um, I'll ask one that's relevant that a lot of people might be thinking about is, what if you share information in regards to uh, what we're doing in terms of forms of ibadah and Ramadan as, as advice or as encouragement or inspiration to close friends and family? Is that okay, or is that crossing the line? 
So there are certain acts of ibadah that they're done publicly intentionally so that people see them, like praying in the masjid, like going for hajj and umrah. You can't really hide those deeds. So this shows us that not all deeds are meant to be done uh, privately. But with that being said, everything else we should try our utmost best to keep it a secret between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we're trying to find motivation and encouragement for people, let us not use ourselves, right? That's almost self-defeating at that point. So if you want to give an example, you can say, you know, I heard this story of someone that prayed uh, all night long and they read the whole entire Quran, right? Even if that was you, attribute it to, to someone else or attribute it to a vagueness or find a story of, you know, like Imam Shafi rahimahullah, in the month of Ramadan, he used to do 60 khatams of the Quran, right? Something like that. You don't have to make yourself the center of attention, right? Why achieve short-term praise for a loss of, a, of mountains of ajr with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you could have hidden it? Don't take that chance. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Jazakumullah khair, Sheikh Naveed. As always, such a treat. Unfortunately, I checked the schedule and we don't have you again in Ramadan 360. I apologize. So this is that, one that and was, done. Uh, this is one and done. Allah. We're going to have to stalk you online and, and figure out this course that you're mentioning and everything that you're doing. May Allah put barakah in it and accept it I from mean, you, Sheikh. It's such a well. pleasure to have you. Likewise. Alhamdulillah that in Ramadan 360 once again. Inshallah, we'll catch you soon online, in person, hopefully somewhere. Uh, but for now, take care. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Awesome sauce. That was Sheikh Naveed Aziz for day number three of Ramadan 360, 30 Quranic principles in 30 days living by the book. Jazakallah khair to all of you who joined us since. I hope that you guys benefited and mashallah, all the great notes that I've been seeing in the chat, please do share them on the Telegram group so that others can benefit as well. There were so many gems to come out of that session and Jazakallah khair to those who also, uh, you know, submitted such beautiful questions. I'm sorry we couldn't have time for everyone, but Alhamdulillah, we have Ustadat Zaymiya. So those who've been triggered into, into you know, into, into, inspired into uh, reflecting on the topic of humility. And shall you have plenty of opportunity to do that with Ustad. That's Amy Azubair. Uh, before we jump in, someone hopefully can drop the telegram link here in the chat for you, Hamza, inshallah. Otherwise, I'll catch it in a second and I'll send it over to you. Before we jump in, of course, Alhamdulillah, this is our third day of 30, 27 more days to go. And our goal always of the Maghrib is to make Islam easy and accessible. And that's part of what we're, we're doing with Ramadan 360. But as I've mentioned, there's so many other programs, Alhamdulillah, that Maghrib invests in to ensure that the community is, is inspired and is confident with knowledge. We have answers to all of our questions. We're able to articulate our deen and to, be, to, to have yakin in it, Alhamdulillah. And that is what we've been mentioning when we've been sharing the daily giving. That is what you'll be contributing to. Um, as you join us and mashallah even as I mentioned the plug earlier uh, there's like I think over a dozen of you have become part of this and we don't honestly care at the, at the end of the day how much is raised we want as many people as possible mashallah we have such a vibrant and such a large community to contribute and make this part of your ajr and make this part of your daily routine this Ramadan inshallah so yesterday our goal was 400 I think mashallah we hit that quite easily so I think we can go maybe 550 today inshallah what do you think? What do you guys think? Do you guys think in the chat that we can hit 550, inshallah, folks who are supporting and who are being, uh, you know, encouraged and being part of the daily giving? I hope that's a yes, inshallah, for you all. And for those who are newer to al Magr, by the way, uh, this has been an organization that we've been around over 20 years, 22 years now, alhamdulillah. It was started by Sheikh Muhammad al-Sharif. Uh, and he's passed away now. It's been a couple of years since his passing, but the legacy that he's built, the Sadaqa Jariya that he's built has continued, alhamdulillah, and it's multiplied. It's increased so much. Ramadan 360, when he was alive, was probably half of this size. And look at where we are now, subhanAllah. It's it's mind-boggling to see. I love, subhanAllah, the the the, the size, the, the increasing of the of the passion in the community. But it's it's not just the the number of people that we impact, it's the the amount of impact is is massive. Is unimaginable. And I love this quote from Sheikh Omar Suleiman. He says that one of the things that Maghrib is always known for is, is growing people and creating a community around knowledge. And I hope that you guys feel that sense of community now as well. You have that excitement around ilm, around speakers, around topics, around in a way that you probably not experienced before and not to this extent. So just keep us in your eyes and make this part of your daily contribution as well. Join us to hit our goals every day in Ramadan. And inshallah, let's make that effort to hit 550 folks supporting the daily, daily giving. Jazakallah khair, brother Bilal for dropping that here in the chat and please click on that link if you're on youtube it's in your description as well
And may Allah make it something that is accepted from all of us and make it a heavy source of Sadaqa Jariyah. We're super excited to continue that journey, inshallah, with you all. Um, with that said, we're going to be jumping into our second portion of the day. Just a reminder, uh, because I know we're still getting into the routine. Routine. There's a lot of new folks on who are contributing that the Dili Quran Reflect starts with a reminder and then a chance for you guys to reflect on the things that you've heard from Sheikh Naveed Aziz and Ustad Ataymiya Zubair today. So we don't want to do too many questions um, during that portion because that takes away from the flow and it becomes more about individual questions as opposed to a kind of a group reflection. So just a friendly reminder for that, inshallah. But I know Sadat Amiya, for once we're on time. She's been waiting patiently for us. Alhamdulillah. So we'll jump into that second part of today's programming and we will start our Quran reflection. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah ustada. How are you doing today? Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Alhamdulillah, I'm good. Jazakallah khairan. Alhamdulillah, that's great to hear. Let's jump in, let's jump in. We have plenty of time, alhamdulillah, now to reflect. All right. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everyone. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi al-kareem. So humility, uh, the concept of humility is something that is so um, broad in our religion that when you want to look at the words that refer to this concept, you find so many. So, you know, for example, when it comes to uh, the concept of God consciousness, you have a word, taqwa, right? You want to see what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about taqwa? You look at the various verses that mention uh, taqwa or where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to have taqwa or where he describes the qualities of people who have taqwa. But when it comes to the concept of humility, there isn't just one word that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses in the Quran. There's so many different words. Different words are used to refer to humility before Allah, before people, in one's manners, in one's behavior. Uh, so inshallah, I, I want to go over a few concepts related to humility before we uh, open up for reflections. Now, uh, humility, uh, the word that I'm going to use is tawadur, all right? And tawadur, uh, humility, is not the opposite of confidence, all right? It is the opposite of being arrogant. It is the opposite of being a snob, basically, all right? Sometimes we misunderstand the concept of humility where we think it's the opposite of confidence. That if I'm humble, then I should be shy. I should be timid. I should be afraid to speak. I should be. Um, uh, I I, sh I shouldn't be, uh, you know, telling people or or informing people about my strengths. But when you look at the Quran, you see that, for example, there were times when when prophets of Allah, uh, you know, they mentioned their strengths before others, like Yusuf alayhi salam, right? He mentioned to the king that I am capable. I am trustworthy. I know how to manage the the the, the treasuries, the the storehouses, right? So uh, humility is not the opposite of confidence. It is the opposite of being a show off. It is the opposite of being arrogant. It is the opposite of being condescending. All right. Now we see that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala commands us to be humble. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said. That in Allah awha ilayya an tawadu. That Allah has revealed to me that all of you should be humble towards one another. And then He explained what that means. He said that no one should oppress another, and no one should boast to another. So being humble means what? that you don't oppress other people, you don't abuse them, you don't take advantage of them, right? And you don't boast to them either, that you don't put them down, you don't ridicule, you don't mock, right? You, you, you don't shatter their confidence. So this is what humility is. This is what the concept of tawadur is in our religion. Now, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us what this humility, what tawadur looks like. So, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the believers in Surah Al-Fatih, verse number 29, where he says that the believers are 
ruhamau baynahum. They are compassionate uh, towards each other. And tarahum rukkaan sujjadan. You see them making rukur and making sajda. So a humble person is not just someone who is cooperative, who is kind, who is, uh, you know, uh, um, nice to other people. But a humble person is also someone who is humble before Allah. So the concept of humility is such that it is, you know, the, the characteristic of humility is something that is reflected in one's worship, all right? and also in one's relationship with people. So before Allah, humility means worshiping Allah. I'm so sorry, I've got a toddler at, at my door. Somebody's just gonna come get him in case you can hear the noise. Sorry about that. Um, okay, Bismillah. So in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us what humility looks like, right? Bismillah. I can't talk if I can hear him cry. I don't know. That's just the mother in me. I'm sorry. Okay, he's taken care of. Alhamdulillah. All right. So back to the concept of humility. All right. So before Allah, humility means what? It means worship, right? It means, as we learned earlier, al-khudur and al-tadallul. It means to lower oneself, to humble oneself. And to be arrogant before Allah means that a person refuses to worship Allah, that a person does not obey Allah, that a person does not praise and thank Allah, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the angels that وَهُمْ لَا يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ that they're not arrogant before Him. Why? Because the angels do whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells them. The angels are afraid of their Lord. The angels constantly glorify and praise and worship their Lord. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the believers in the Quran that the true believers are who? That when they are reminded of the verses of Allah, what happens to them? They fall into sajda. Meaning they, they literally prostrate and they, they go into humble obedience. And Allah says, وَهُمْ لَا يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ Again, they are not arrogant. So humility before Allah is that a person is not, uh, uh, is not arrogant in the sense that they, they, they don't refuse worship, they don't refuse obedience to Allah. They, they, they are grateful to Allah. Humility is also in one's manners, right? And it is also you know, towards people in general. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Luqman, the advice that Luqman gave to his son, that وَلَا تُصَعِرْ خَدَّكَ للناس, That do not turn your cheek towards people. And he not looking at them, rather turning your cheek towards them, and he not even making eye contact, not, not acknowledging their presence. This is extreme arrogance. وَلَا تَمْشِ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَحَا And do not walk on the earth arrogantly. Why? Because Allah does not like every person who is muhtal, who is fakhur. Muhtal is who? Someone who thinks very highly of himself. And fakhur is the one who is, who is boasting, who's always, you know, talking about themselves, uh, you know, showing off in front of others. So humility is to be towards people in general but especially towards believers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the believers as adhillatin ala al-mu'mineen, that they're humble towards the believers, meaning towards each other. In one place in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, instructs his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that waqfid janahaka lil mu'mineen, that you should lower your wing uh, for the believers. And lowering your wing means what? that you are humble uh, with them, meaning you, you don't treat them harshly. And inshallah, we'll talk a little bit more about lowering the wing. Now, out of all people, who deserves the most that we are humble with them? Out of all people that, okay, mashallah, Brother Bilal is like on point. Parents, mashallah, right away, he had the answer. Barakallahu uh, 
this is very true because in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only tells us very directly that we should be humble towards our parents, he also presents to us examples of prophets, all right, who were humble towards their parents. In Surah Maryam, we have the example of Yahya alayhi salam, who had such amazing characteristics, right? The fact that he was wise even as a child, right? That he was a devout worshiper from the very beginning. He was very God-fearing. And Allah says about him, وَبَرَّمْ بِوَالِدَيْهِ He was very dutiful towards his parents. وَلَمْ يَكُنْ جَبَّارٌ عَصِيَّةٌ And he was not someone who was, uh, a, a, who was arrogant, who was harsh, who was disobedient. You notice two things are mentioned about Yahya The fact that he is dutiful towards his parents, that he would care for them, he was obedient to them, and right away Allah says that he was not a disobedient tyrant. Meaning he was not disobedient to Allah, he was not disobedient to his parents. And the thing is that the person who is good towards their parents will be good towards the rest of the people also. Your relationship with your parents determines your true character and your level of piety. If you are respectful towards them, only then can you be respectful towards your spouse. Because with your parents, you are you, you feel the safest, right? You can say anything, you can do anything, you can throw a tantrum, you can misbehave, right? That's how it's supposed to be, all right? I'm, I'm talking about general cases. I'm not talking about those few cases uh, or extreme cases in which there's abuse. I'm talking about general uh, cases. That if a person is not able to show respect to their parents, all right, then they're not able to show respect to other people for long. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes Isa alayhi salam in the same surah where Isa alayhi salam said, وَبَرَّمْ بِوَالِدَتِي Meaning my Lord has made me dutiful to my mother. وَلَمْ يَجْعَلْنِي جَبَّارٌ شَقِيَّ And he has not made me a wretched tyrant. Again, dutiful to my mother and not a wretched tyrant. Which means that a person who is wretched, who, who is a tyrant right, who is jabbar, who is harsh, who is rude, who is arrogant, they cannot be dutiful towards their parents. It's not possible. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also presents to us in Surah Maryam the example of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam's father was extremely harsh, extremely harsh, rude, um, abusive, you name it, he was. He tried to kill Ibrahim alayhi salam. All right, uh, he he is the one who uh, you know contributed to that fire, that huge fire in which the people had to catapult Ibrahim alayhi salam into because it was so huge they couldn't go close to it. And this mushrik father, all right, who uh, was uh, any someone who would make idols, worship idols. He, who didn't know anything, who was so backward, all right, and who was so abusive that he attempted to kill his own son. How does Ibrahim alayhi salam talk to his father arrogantly as an equal? No. Ibrahim alayhi salam says to him, Ya Abati, oh my dear father, oh my dear father, he is so respectful. This is humility. Humility is a, is a part of, of a person, all right? It cannot be faked. If you fake it, what's going to happen? It's, it's going to leave you, all right, in, in stressful situations. Ibrahim salam, is so humble, all right? He has real humility, which is why he's even able to speak to his abusive father with respect. And remember that uh, being humble just as it is not 
the op uh, just as it is not the opposite of being confident, being humble is not synonymous to being weak. All right. Humility is not equal to weakness. Humility is with dignity. Because you know that as a human being, it doesn't befit you to be harsh and be arrogant and to uh, put yourself where you don't belong or to present yourself as who you are not. Humility is not synonymous to weakness. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us the opposite. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa told us the opposite. That when you are humble, Allah will elevate you. Right? We think that if we're humble, then we're going to be treated as a doormat. No. Look at the example of Ibrahim alayhi salam. It was his principle, right, that he was a humble person and that humility he showed even when he was dealing with his mushrik father. So he continued to be respectful until the very end of their relationship, right? But what happened? Did Ibrahim alayhi salam lose out? No. Look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevated him. Ibrahim alayhi salam, yes, he lost his father, yes. But look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him Ismail. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him Ishaq. After Ishaq, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him Yaqub. All of them, alayhim wa salam, prophets of Allah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the one who lowers himself for the sake of Allah, and he, and he showed with his hand, Right? He, he, he turned his palm over all right, and he brought it close to the ground that whoever lowers himself for the sake of Allah, Allah elevates him. The Prophet ﷺ showed with his hand. So never think that if you are humble for the sake of Allah, you will be humiliated and that you will be weak and you will be left poor and that people will take advantage of you and that they will abuse you. People cannot harm you more than the harm that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already decreed for you. They cannot benefit you more than the benefit that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already decreed for you. So don't lose your principles, all right, in dealing with people. And he, your akhlaq, the way that you carry yourself, the way that you talk, the kind of language you use, even your, your eyes, your body language, all of that should be in a very dignified way because that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likes. So in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Isra, verses 23 to 24, that, illa iya, that your Lord has decreed that you should not worship anyone but Him. Ihsana, and that you must do ihsan towards your parents. And then Allah mentions that if your parents... All right, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing the translation. One of them or both of them reach old age while they're with you, then do not even say oof to them. And, in, and, and do not yell at them. And instead, you should say qawlan karima, honorable words. And you speak to them respectfully. Speak to them softly. And this is the interpretation that Many Mufassirin gave that qawlan karima means that you speak to them softly. You don't raise your voice. In fact, we learn about Abdullah ibn Aun that once his mother called him and he answered her and he was about to go to her. But in the way that he answered her, he realized that his voice was very loud. And men, you know, because their, their voice is loud, sometimes they're not trying to yell. They're not trying to yell. Right, but the fact that they just say something loudly come across as comes across as harsh and scary, right? So he he raised his voice, you know, to tell his mother that he was coming, but it came across as harsh. You know what he did? He freed a slave. He freed a slave because he felt afraid that he had disobeyed Allah. This is the opposite of qawl and karima. This is not respectful. This is not humble towards my mother. This is being arrogant towards my mother. Then Allah says, lahuma min That lower before them the, your wing of mercy. 
lower your wing of mercy in front of them and then pray for them. Now, what does it mean by lowering your wing? Because, I mean, as humans, we, we don't have wings. So there's two interpretations of this. One interpretation is that just like birds, you know, they spread, they lower their wings in order to cover and protect their young, you should also be protective of your parents and care for them. Because they did that for you when you were young. Now it's your job to be protective of them and to care for them. And another interpretation, the second interpretation is that this means that you should be humble before them. You see, when a bird flies, what does it do? It uh, spreads its wings. It lowers its wings. All right. And then it goes high right? Down and up, down and up, right? Also, when when a bird needs to come down, all right, what does it do? Again, it lowers its wings. So there's two things that we can learn from this. The first thing is that lower your wings before your parents, meaning come down to the to the ground level, please. You might think that you're high and mighty now because you drive a fancy car or you earn a six-figure salary every year now. So, you know, you're like, you know, super amazing Mr. Pa, you know, Mr. Fancy, Miss Fancy, and now your parents don't know the trends or they don't know, uh, you know, your language or they don't have the money that you have. Come to the ground, please. And sometimes you, you experience this in your life, that your parents are not as technologically advanced as you are, right? You show them this is the Wi-Fi, this is a password, this is how you do it, and then they want it done again and again and again. You show them how to update their phone, how to install an app, but they don't get it, right? So you you get annoyed, you get irritated. No, come to the ground level, please. Be humble with your parents. Be helpful, be dutiful, be kind. And this also shows us that when a bird lowers its wings, what happens? It only goes higher. It has the ability to fly high. So when you will humble yourself before before your parents, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will elevate you in the heavens. And Imam Ghazali, he uh, uh, writes about the etiquette that the, that the son should have with his father, all right? He says that the son should listen to the speech of his father, meaning when the father is talking, the son should be listening, not trying to talk over the father, not interrupting the father. No, listen when he talks. Stand up when he gets up. Not that, hey, dad, can you get me water, please? Uh, I mean, yes, it's nice that you have a friendly relationship. That's great. And once in a while, it's fine. But don't be ordering your parents around as if they were your co-equal or that, or as if they were younger than you. He says th- that he should obey the, the command of his father. He should not walk in front of him. He should not raise his voice in front of his father. And he should strive to please his father. And he should be patient with his father. And that he should not remind his father of all the good things that he's been doing for him. He should not look at him angrily. And he should not bring any displeasure on his face in front of his father. Subhanallah. This is what humility looks like. This is real humility. When the people closest to us, they see our humility. They they are treated well by us. In front of people we don't know, in front of strangers, it's very nice to be helpful, right? Especially, you know, please, thank you, sorry. It's it's very easy to do that. But what about the people who are closest to us? All right, let's open up for reflections. Bismillah. Amina. 
I go cinema. Um, so I was, as I was, so this is the reflection, but as I was listening to the lectures about being humble, I realized how in connection, how connected it is. So in order to have like sincerity with like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your actions, you need to be humble. And mm -hmm. I think that was, that was a really great, that just sparked in my mind and I wanted to share that with everyone. Excellent, excellent. And the thing is, it's also related to taqwa, right? The more conscious of Allah a person is, the more humble they will be in, in different scenarios. Barakallahu fiki. Maheen? Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. This was really very, very helpful. Everything that you said has given us a lot of food for thought. So uh, just coming back to your thing about arrogance against Allah and arrogance or, you know, devotion to Allah and stuff and arrogance against people. So there is a hadith of the Prophet in which he has said something about beauty and the other person said, you know, we like to dress up and the, and the Prophet says, well, Allah likes beauty. But then he describes arrogance in two sections. He said, Al-Kibr Batr al haq so does that mean arrogance against Allah? Because the other one says, an ghamatun nas. That is definitely arrogance mm -hmm. against uh, people. So is mm -hmm. this what the hadith is basically saying, that arrogance is of two types, where you're rejecting the yeah. truth? Uh, th that is a correct understanding. Uh, but any rejecting the truth can also be uh, any refusing to accept your mistake in front of people. Okay, yeah, true. Okay. So okay. it's yeah. not just before Allah, it's also before people. And in fact, the one who is arrogant with people is also going to be arrogant with Allah. Right? Yes, I mean, the first sin was arrogance. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. When Iblis refused to obey Allah because of mm -hmm. arrogance. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jazakallah. Aisha? Um, Saima, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi Um, please, can I speak? Who is this? Who is uh, this? Uh, Aisha. Okay, sure. Okay, sure. Um, alhamdulillah for another opportunity today and then uh, what i want to add is that um for a very long time in my society um timidity is seen as a sign of respect so alhamdulillah in today's session i've seen that we can still be very firm about our principles and what we believe in but still be very humble to our parents and those closest to us alhamdulillah mm -hmm. thank you so much Saima? Sister Tamia, I uh, Jazakallah for all the information that you give us. Uh, in terms of humility, I just want to say that I've been uh, following you for since COVID times and the humility in your teachings and the way you teach us about all the topics and especially today about humility, it sets really deep within me. So I just wanted to say thank you. Gia's, uh, Gia, go ahead. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, for me, um, what I, I think is the more you're devoted to Allah, the most you're dutiful to your parents. I think the Hukukullah basically connects us with the Hukukullah. And the Hukuk al connects us with the Hukuk Allah. Like if we are devoted in any case, then we are most dutiful in the other case. Alhamdulillah. This is what I could gather for, for myself today from this session. Alhamdulillah. And Jazakallah khair for everything that you've been teaching us. And I've been learning a lot from you, sister. May Allah bless and protect you always. Okay. Um, Sana? Um, I, um, first of all, thank you for your uh, sharing beautiful gems around humility. I've been your student virtually, never had the opportunity to speak to you, so I'm really excited to talking to you directly today. Um, 
I have a question and a little bit of a comment. So when you're living far from your parents and you're not with them and you don't get enough opportunity to kind of serve them or display humility, there are there are instances where you feel like the way or the decisions they are taking about themselves or um, other matters, you can counsel them. Does that come into like not showing humility or teaching your parents? But if it's coming from good intention, um, is it, um, it does it come under arrogance? It it really matters. Uh, it really depends on how you speak to them, right? Um, I mean, yes, you want them to be able to do things themselves and be independent so that they're not always relying on someone to come and fix little things for them. Um, but at the same time, uh, you can't push them beyond what they're comfortable with. And you can't scold them. You can't, uh, you know, talk to them in, in the way that you would talk to a younger person mm -hmm. or someone who is equal to you. Right. Just Solange. Solange. Um, I was thinking how Ibrahim alayhi salam, he did not just um, treat his father well in his face. He also kept making dua for him until even Allah had to uh, instruct him to stop. So it was not like some kind of shallow jacket that he just takes off. It was part of him to be humble towards his father and and that that also reminds me of taqwa how you always act be in a certain way it's not just like you're you know what i mean mm -hmm. it's part of yeah. you yeah barakallahu fiki excellent reflection um zakia Assalamu alaikum. Uh, first, yeah, may Allah reward you for what you said about how to treat your parents. Um, I was thinking about something. Many people regret their behavior towards their parents after they die and wish they can go back and treat them better. Uh, so I was thinking maybe we should think about this and start now so, so that we don't have uh, any regrets after they die. And a question to you, isn't there a hadith that your parents are, as long as they are alive, they are an easy way for you to Jannah? Yeah, they're, they're like your door to paradise, your yes, way so. of serving them is, is a way of getting paradise. Oh, alhamdulillah. Okay. Thank you. Um. So I've read a couple of uh, questions in the chat related to um, basically creating boundaries uh, because of, um, you know, certain situations becoming very toxic. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, for example, as an adult, uh, especially if it's not your parents, but your spouse's parents, if living with them can create constant unpleasantness and constant unease, which causes you to be disrespectful, um, then it's better to create those boundaries. And, you know, for example, move out. You're not doing anything wrong. Uh, a, a man has to provide for his family, for his wife. And yes, he also has a duty towards his parents. It's not either or, it's both of them. So sometimes people think that, you know, a man should be good towards his mother. And if culturally she wants that, you know, he... Uh, lives with her, uh, he lives with the parents, with, you know, his wife and children, then he should continue to do that, even though that makes the life of his wife extremely difficult. Um, this is this is cultural. This is not Islamic. All right. And if living in this situation is only creating more difficulty for you and for your wife, then um, why, why burden yourself with so-called piety that, that you cannot meet the the standard of 
right? Uh, create ease for yourself and your family. And you'll notice that, inshallah, um, your relationship will actually become better over time. Everybody needs their space. And, and this, is, uh, the, this is not um, cutting off from the parents, and this is not uh, being disrespectful towards them. This is just uh, fulfilling your duty towards your family and also towards your parents. And uh, you can do that in, in a respectful way. You can communicate in a respectful way. You can set boundaries in a respectful way. Inshallah. Um, Siri? Go ahead. Yeah, um, hello. Um, it's just a little thing that I've seen in the comments a lot. Um, I love, I, what I've gained from it is um, humility can be a form of discipline for oneself and towards others and the one for yourself is like obviously you could fix up on it get better up and down like you mentioned in previous um, days sorry previous nights and towards others will be harder that's when the harder test will be and I see all the comments that people are making especially towards their parents which is one of the hardest tests it could be so we get examples mm -hmm. from our Ibrahim alayhi salam amongst others, how they treat the good and the bad. And that gives a form of sukoon, especially when it comes to my personal situation, is very similar to some other people's, there's good days and bad days, but to have consistency and just perseverance um, actually waves all the turbulent times. And that what's helped me a lot. And I hope people who are watching this could help them as well. Yeah, that's my comment for that one. Thank you so much for sharing about color Vicky. Um Rawan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Zakilla khairan fearan a shaykh taimiya. I'll keep it short, inshallah. My question is um sometimes when we are uh when we are being humble and like we're trying to practice humility, uh people think we have a weak personality and they do not respect us and they I don't know, like they but yeah, they kind of like do not respect the person or like, I don't know, mistreat you, things like that. So how how should a person, of course, like, yes, our aim is Jinnah and we don't really care for, yes, Dunya, but yeah. still like the Muslim, um, as Muslims, like like we said, that humility is like, it's kind of equal to dignity. So like, what's like, how should we go about this? Shazakallah khair. Look, humility does not mean weakness, okay? You can speak for yourself. You can defend yourself in a respectful way, in a, in a clear way. You can demand your rights in a clear way, uh, in a respectful way. But uh, any, the best example for us is the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ, he was very humble. He was not someone who would, you know, that if you saw him, uh, you would feel afraid of him. No, you would feel comfortable in his presence. You knew that he wouldn't uh, hurt you, that he wouldn't say anything offensive to you. Uh, you, you. You would find him to be approachable. You would find him to be such that you can ask him anything. Uh, you can talk to him. So this is what humility is, that you are approachable. You are uh, courteous. You are respectful. You are easygoing. And you're not unnecessarily, um, you know, difficult with people, right? Um, so, and, and where people think that you are weak because you're talking softly, then it doesn't matter. Let them think what they think. That doesn't, their thinking does not define who you are. They perceive you as weak. They treat you maybe as weak. But ultimately, they cannot uh, deprive you from something that Allah has written for you. And they cannot take away uh, something from you that Allah has destined for you. Umber? Assalamu alaikum, sister. Thank you so much um, for your talk. I am... Um... I had a question about dealing with an arrogant person. 
and like um just the t like the kind of traits like if you try to explain something they don't want to listen to the truth or um your opinions and not taking accountability or you know turning around you know how some people might accuse you of something but they're the ones doing it themselves and that kind of stuff so what would be the best approach to deal with this person mm -hmm. again when we look at the way of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he had to deal with a lot of arrogant people right uh, mm -hmm. hypocrites they would you know lie behind him they would come and say something completely different in front of him um the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam also had to deal with the arrogance of the jews in medina he had to deal with the arrogance of the mushrikeen in mecca um but the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh any for example when it comes to the, to the hypocrites he uh, he was told in the quran to ignore them to turn away from them to basically not bother with them right uh the mushrikeen also allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says wahjurhum hajran jamila leave them beautifully all right so there are times when talking to someone helps right because they're receptive they 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 care about the relationship and then there are those who are narcissists right who don't who don't care about the relationship who only care about themselves how can you convince such a person you can't mm -hmm. so you're only hitting your head on the wall trying to convince them trying to make them see trying to make them realize right so what's the best thing turn away from them ignore them just know that your lord knows what's happening right and um you ask allah to take care of your affairs and just remember that in in your uh uh in, in your um uh your striving to remain within the boundaries that allah has set for you inshallah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of you just as he took care of his prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam inshallah inshallah thank you jazakallah khair mubarak thank you ayat last comment inshallah and then we should conclude go ahead assalamu alaikum I, yeah, I just had a question. Um, so like, um, uh, I really want to uh, get into like hijab, like get into my hijab journey, but my parents think that it could be restricting my freedom, and uh, it is like I'm too young to do it. So how should I convince them? Okay, so first of all, we all make dua over here for you, May Allah Subhanahu. Wa Tara, strengthen you in this journey and give you the ability to uh, begin this and be steadfast in it inshallah everybody say ameen okay good um so uh, it's it's very important to discuss this with your parents and ask them you know um for their support because you want to obey allah you want to do something that is pleasing to your lord and, may, you know, the thing is that your parents, they want the best for you. They worry about you. They're scared for you. Uh, I don't know where you live, but in, you know, different parts of the world, it's it's not easy to be visibly Muslim. So your the fears of your parents are real. They're, they're, they're genuine. They're, they're not necessarily overthinking. But this is where our faith in Allah, our trust in Allah must be stronger than the fear that we may have. So talk to your parents about it. Ask them that this is something that I really want to do. I, I want you to support me. I want your help in this. And make a lot of dua. Ask Allah. It's Ramadan. Ask Allah every day. Oh Allah, make this easy for me. Oh Allah, help me in this. Oh Allah, I want to do this. And then take the name of Allah and begin, inshallah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He promises us that that um, that if you uh, help the cause of Allah, Allah will help you, right? Where you thabit aqdamakum, and He will He will plant your feet firm, and He He will give you the strength to continue. So that strength comes from Allah. 
So ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help you in this, inshallah. All right, we will conclude over here. Hafsa, over to you. Jazakumullah khair, Ustada Taymiya, and to all of you uh, who got hopped on the mic and shared in the chat. Um, I just wanted to highlight a reminder again. It's very hard for the, the speaker to, to do so, so I'll have to be the bad cop. Uh, in the sense that, mashallah, I know I'm so happy that many of you found this topic to be relatable. And I love that, mashallah, so many of you are supporting each other in the chat and sharing your personal challenges and and giving advice and and, and support, mashallah. Um, but I just want to remind that when you're getting on the mic, just for, to, for the sake of the flow and for the sake of the purpose of the session is try to keep that to reflections only. We have a fatwa night happening this upcoming Sunday at 2 p.m. EST with Sheikh Abu Isa Nimutullah. So if you have specific questions or, or specifically, especially for Ramadan and, and fiqh and anything detailed like that, feel Feel free to drop them into the Q&A form that's already available in your student portal under the hand raise icon. So if you click on that icon above the welcome video, inshallah, you'll be able to click on that form and submit any questions that you have. But Jazakum Allah khair. I love the participation and this just the genuine help and the love and the support that you're giving to each other in the, in the chat, mashallah. It's lovely to see. Reminder once again, Sheikh Ammar's YouTube series is continuing today, inshallah. The, t- the name he's covering today, I believe, is Al Karim. So hop on there. I think he's just launched the video a couple hours ago and send him some love. I know he was he was talking about reading the chat. <laughs> Nobody's commenting in the chat. So let's show him that we're we're here and we're benefiting inshallah and share our gems there in the chat as well. Of course, keep up with us on our Telegram, WhatsApp and Telegram announcement group so that you can continue this conversation after the sessions and share any gems and any reflections that you have there inshallah. There are links to that in the chat here as well if you've not joined there already. And as always, mashallah, since we mentioned it earlier, uh, another co- dozen or so of you have supported the Daily Given campaign. Uh, Jazak Malkir for making us part of your daily kind of rewards in Sadaqah during Ramadan. Uh, we're at 427 right now. I know we said 550. Let's see that happen, inshallah. If you're watching in the recording, if you're in the chat, you didn't get a chance to, to hop on to the amalgrib.org slash give daily link. Please do so now, inshallah, and join us for our daily giving. And as someone was asking earlier, basically you're getting charged every single day in the month of Ramadan, and then it ends at the end of the month. So it's not going to be like a lump sum at the end. We want to make sure that you guys are getting that daily ajr and that daily reward and you're automating your good deeds. And of course, as always, please support our amazing charity partners for Ramadan 360, HHRD in the US, Forgotten Woman in the UK, and Islamic Relief in Canada. It was a huge pleasure spending the third day of Ramadan with you all. We look forward to seeing you guys again tomorrow for day number four. And tomorrow's topic is going to be submission with Sheikh Saad Taslim. Looking forward to that, inshallah, once again. For now, take care, stay happy, stay healthy, stay safe. And assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everyone.